Good evening, I'm David Kramer with Alaska Weather. As always, please visit our website, weather.gov slash Alaska. You can get any updates to our forecast or check out any watches, warnings, or advisories that we might have out for your area. Also call our weather info line, 1-800-472-0391, getting the updates to the forecast, so that means as well. And you can email me at the address at the bottom of the screen, david.kramer at noaa.gov. Taking a look now, one of the warnings that we have out for Southeast Alaska, is in the southern inner channels. That does include Ketchikan and Metlakatla. And we're looking at wind gusts getting as high as 60 miles per hour. That is in effect now with that high wind warning until 10 p.m. this evening. As you look up further to the north, we'll start up along the Arctic coastline there. We have a winter weather advisory out for snow and blowing snow for the Dead Horse area. That is gonna be out until 6 a.m. on Monday morning. So continuing from now through the night into 6 a.m. on Monday. Then also we have the blizzard warning for the Kaktovik area. And that is gonna be out also until 6 a.m. on Monday. Remember with that blizzard warning, strong winds gusting up to 35 miles per hour higher, and we do have visibilities dropping down to a quarter mile or less at times. Moving down into the interior portion of the state, primary concern is flooding as we start to enter the breakup season. We do have out on the Salter River, a flood watch that is in effect. It's near the bridge, ice jam flooding. And that is gonna be out until Tuesday afternoon. And then as we look up by the Chena River, we have a flood advisory that is out near Freeman Road. And we, that is also due to ice jam flooding. And that's going to be out through Monday night. Taking a look at the rest of our breakup map, we can see some uh, open water down in the south by the Nushigak, and we have some more open water up by the Tanana. Uh, one thing of note that doesn't specify particularly on the map is that we are seeing some ice lifting on the Kuskokwim, Yukon, and Koyukuk rivers. Be mindful of that, and there's also some activity on the uh, tributaries of the Kuskokwim that the River Forecast Center is monitoring. Uh, please check out the River Forecast Center's map. You can get there from the weather.gov website for any additional resources that you need for the breakup season. And we'll continue to watch those. And again, it's worth noting that we do have the flooding on the China and on the Sacha right now due to some ice jam that is also being continued to monitor. Looking at our satellite imagery, we have a couple low pressure systems out near the Gulf spinning around. One is headed towards Southeast Alaska. We can see the cloud cover out in advance of that system, bringing some rain to especially the Southern locations of the Panhandle. It's also helping to create that pressure gradient, giving us those stronger winds for the Panhandle area. And as we look out over mainland Alaska, we're actually gonna see the lack of cloud cover due to some high pressure that's helping to keep some clear skies and fair weather for much of uh, the central and Southern portions of the mainland. As we look out to the west, low pressure near the Shimia area, bringing some lighter cloud cover there, some spottier showers. And then finally, we can see uh, the multiple little weak disturbances moving around the southeastern portion of the Bering near the eastern Aleutians and Alaska Peninsula as well, bringing some cloud cover and precipitation to those areas. Taking a look now for the remainder of the day, we can see one of those weaker lows moving by the eastern Aleutians, bringing some showers to the central and eastern Aleutians, as well as by the Pribilof Islands. And we can also see another low by the western Aleutians, bringing some lighter rain showers to that area as well. We do have our low up along the Arctic coastline, bringing some snow along the coast, and those blowing snow conditions that we saw bringing the winter weather advisory for blowing snow, and those blizzard conditions out by Barter Island and Kaktovik. Uh, so be mindful of that up there. Down in the interior portions of the state through the rest of mainland Alaska, we're seeing the clear skies and fair weather. And then we have that other system that's near the southeastern portions of the Gulf of Alaska, pushing a front towards the Panhandle area, bringing some of that heavier rain to those southern locations of the Panhandle, and also those stronger winds as you can really see the tighter pressure gradient around that 975 millibar low. As you look into tonight, that low's starting to fill now, but still strong enough to have some of those stronger winds and we'll be continuing to taper down throughout the nighttime hours, but still gonna have that heavy rain, especially in the southern portions of the Panhandle, and some showers by the Yakutat area as well. 
As far as mainland Alaska, however, we're going to see a lot of the clear skies extending from the central portion to the west coast and down in south central. But we still have our system up to the north bringing some snow to the Arctic coastline and blowing snow conditions, especially in those more eastern locations. Down in the Bering Sea and Aleutians, we'll have some lighter showers for the central and eastern Aleutians. And then another frontal system approaching the western Aleutians from the North Pacific, beginning to bring some rain and areas of fog closer to the islands. As you look into Monday, that system is going to be pushing into the western Aleutians, extending that rain over the area. Some weaker disturbances moving through the southern portions of the Bering and near the eastern Aleutians, bringing some rain to those areas as well. But continuing to see the ridging jutting in over much of the central interior, extending out those nicer and fair weather conditions for much of mainland Alaska. However, up along the Arctic coastline, going to still see that frontal system hanging out up there, bringing more snow to the area. Our other system in the Gulf is training several different lows over the area, seeing a continued stretch of or fetch of long or moisture coming in from the North Pacific, bringing continued rain to areas of central and southern interior, or panhandle rather, that's diminishing as we get further to the north in those areas. As so we look into Tuesday, another system coming in, bringing more rain to the panhandle area extending up towards the northern locations as well, getting lighter as we get further to the north and closer to the Yakutat area. Out of our mainland Alaska, continued nice weather into Tuesday. That's going to extend up into the interior, west coast, and south central. And then a lingering front along the Arctic coastline, bringing that lighter snow to the area. Our ridging is now extending across the west coast through the eastern Aleutian Islands, keeping the frontal system pushing in from the west at bay, holding it over the central Aleutians for the time being on Tuesday, bringing rain to the central Aleutians. Then we will have some wraparound moisture on the back side of that low, bringing some rain into the western Aleutians as well. Taking a look at our temperatures starting Monday morning, we'll stay out in the Aleutians, down into the mid-30s for the Aleutians, into the Alaska Peninsula as well. Colder by the Pribilofs, 27 degrees expected low for St. Paul. In the upper 20s for the Bristol Bay area, with Dillingham, King Salmon, Ellen, and Iliamna all dropping down to 29 degrees. In the mid-20s for much of the YK Delta area, however, getting colder as we get further to the north, looking at teens for the Seward Peninsula area and for St. Lawrence Island, up into the Kotzebue Sound area. And then we have teens also extending up to much of the Arctic coastline with Dead Horse getting a little bit colder there, dropping down to 9 degrees. Coldest in the state, however, is going to be Arctic Village, dropping down to minus 4. Then we'll have teens to the mid-20s for much of the interior. And then we'll have into the 30s for much of the south central area, especially along the coast. Colder as we get to the more interior locations with the Glen Allen area dropping down to 18 degrees. Down to right around 40 degrees for much of the Panhandle area with Yakutat getting a little colder there at 36 degrees. Monday afternoon highs getting up into the mid to upper 40s with some locations like Juneau and Skagway getting up to right around 50 degrees. Into the 50s for much of south central Alaska with Kodiak getting up to 47 degrees. Into the upper 30s to lower 40s for much of the interior portion of the state. That's going to extend down into much of the YK Delta area as well. Again, however, colder as we get further to the north. Seward Peninsula in the 20s. And as we get up into the Brooks Range and along the Arctic coastline, upper teens to right around 20 degrees for those highs. Dropping all the way down to the Bristol Bay area, getting up into the lower 50s, and then into the 40s for the Alaska Peninsula, and into the mid to upper 30s all along the Aleutian Islands and the Pribilof Islands. Tuesday morning lows dropping down to 27 degrees for the Pribilof Islands, mid 30s for the Aleutian Islands and Alaska Peninsula, then into the mid to upper 20s for the Bristol Bay area, mid to lower 20s for the YK Delta area, getting up to, or getting down to the teens for the Seward Peninsula and St. Lawrence Island, including Kotzebue Sound as well, and then in the teens for much of the Arctic coastline, single digits through the Brooks Range. And then in the teens for northern locations of the interior, getting into the 20s for southern locations, with Galena getting down to 18 degrees. Down in south central Alaska, dropping down into the 30s, with some places getting below freezing. Uh, Kenai getting down to 29 degrees, 25 at Talkeetna, and 22 there at Glen Allen. Staying above freezing along the coastline, with Cordova dropping down to 38 degrees. And then for the Panhandle area, dropping down into the 30s for most locations. Some places further to the south and closer to the coastline, dropping down to right around 40, with 40 degrees at Sitka and Ketchikan. Getting into Tuesday afternoon, getting back up into the mid to upper 40s for much of the Panhandle area. Into the 50s for the majority of South Central Alaska, Kodiak getting up to 49 degrees. 
in the mid to upper 30s to right around 40 degrees for much of the interior, getting warmer as we get further into the southwest, getting up to around 50 degrees for Dillingham and other locations around Bristol Bay. So we get further north in the state, a little bit colder, staying in the 20s and teens for much of the northern half of the state, and then getting up into the mid to upper 30s to right around 40 degrees for the Aleutian Islands. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Hello, I'm meteorologist Carrie Hazley with a look at aviation weather across the state. Starting off things Monday morning, we'll take a look down over the Panhandle where we will see IFR conditions to start the day out along the Arctic coast and also IFR conditions over the southern third of the Panhandle. Also some patchy IFR over a lot of the terrain, marginal VFR elsewhere down over the southeast part of the state. This all due to a fairly strong weather system out over the Gulf of Alaska that will be dominating the weather in that particular area. Up over the Arctic coast, we do see IFR conditions stretching from just west of Utkiagvik all the way over to the Alaska-Canadian border with some marginal VFR conditions out over the northern plain there stretching all the way into the northern slopes of the Brooks Range. IFR conditions out over a good portion of the Bering including St. Lawrence Island to the Bering Strait and then down towards Nunavak Island also uh, St. Lawrence Island and then over towards the Bristol Bay area we should see some IFR conditions to kick off the Monday morning there as well. Up on the Arctic coast we will see some improvement that IFR should uh, fade away but we will end up keeping marginal VFR conditions across the entire Arctic tomorrow and then also uh, marginal VFR conditions along the uh, coastal plain there and to the uh, northern slopes of the Brooks Range. IFR conditions offshore across much of the Bering Coast and all along the Aleutians. We'll continue to see IFR impacting St. Lawrence Island, a part of Nunavak Island, but some improvement over places like Bristol Bay that are going to start out a bit lower. Also, IFR conditions persist tomorrow afternoon over much of the Gulf. However, marginal VFR conditions will dominate the inland areas where people are most likely to be flying, particularly the southern half of the Panhandle, and then the coastal areas stretching around towards Yaktat. Into the day on Tuesday, we see some of that IFR over southeast Alaska work its way back westward, where it could be impacting Kodiak Island by Tuesday morning. Some IFR conditions just outside the area there at Kodiak proper could creep their way in as we get into uh, the Tuesday morning down in that part of the state. Marginal VFR conditions across southeast Alaska, marginal VFR conditions Tuesday morning up on the Arctic coast, and then we do see some IFR conditions for Tuesday morning to kick off the day along a lot of the uh, yukon Kuskokwim Delta coast, and also again over Bristol Bay in St. Lawrence Island into the afternoon on Tuesday. A little bit of improvement most places, although we will see marginal VFR conditions linger across much of the Panhandle on Tuesday and also across a good portion of northwestern mainland Alaska from a dead horse over towards the, uh, the Seward Peninsula all along the coastal areas there. Marginal VFR conditions are along a good portion of the Alaska Peninsula and the uh, Bristol Bay area there with some IFR conditions off coast or offshore for the Tuesday afternoon. As far as past conditions go. Let's start up north first. VFR will be the prevailing conditions through Anatovic Pass, although once you get out on that northern plain, we will look for marginal VFR conditions to persist. Same is going to be true for adding and pass for your Monday. And then down to the Alaska Range, good flying weather conditions with VFR prevailing for both Lake Clark and Merrill, also prevailing for a rainy pass and then over towards Windy Pass, we'll continue to see VFR conditions. Good flying day for tomorrow across much of mainland Alaska. Uh, Isabel Pass, she should be VFR far for your Monday. Same is going to be true for Mentasta as well as over towards Tanita Pass. Down towards Portage Pass, another nice day for Monday, so we will look for VFR conditions through Portage Pass then. The lowest conditions are going to be down over Chilkoot and White Pass with the weather system in the Gulf of Alaska impacting the Panhandle. We will look for those passes to be VFR or IFR. As far as freezing levels go, we do have the surface freezing line just to the north of kind of South Central Alaska and then draping its way down into the Bristol Bay area just to the west of Dillingham. So a pretty good um, temperatures below freezing in the northern part of the state. That's really a function of a lot of clear skies across much of the interior. And then as we get further south, we see that 2,000 foot freezing level uh, stretching its way from just north of south central down into southeast Alaska as well as stretching over into Bristol Bay. And then the 4,000 foot freezing level line is going to be just offshore. For icing tomorrow, the majority of what we're going to see is going to be down over the panhandle with a weather system down there. Uh, we could see just a little bit of considerable moderate ice. Most of that's going to be isolated. Also a little bit of isolated ice up over the Arctic and maybe a little bit out around Shemia. As far as winds go, the jet stream stays well south of our airspace, although pretty strong, peaking out at about 130 knots, pretty close to our airspace. Also a weak jet pushing its way into the northern part of the state there at about 90 knots. 
Down at 9,000 feet, strongest winds will be down over the panhandle. We're over much of the flying area, about 40 knots, and then over towards Yakutat, 30 knots, also some strong winds at 9,000 feet out along the Aleutians. And then at 3,000 feet, again, some strongest winds down over the Panhandle, peaking out around Yakutat at about 50 knots, also some stronger winds along the Aleutians. That's going to translate into some turbulence over the Panhandle, considerable moderate below about 5,000 feet, also some considerable moderate out around Chemia. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and joining us here today is Eric Stevens from the Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, GINA for short. And Eric, you frequently come on the show to tell us about these really cool things that we're doing with satellites over Alaska and how we can use these really awesome tools. But I'm thinking all the while there has to be a mad scientist somewhere working on the next cool thing in the satellite laboratory. What, what is being developed today? Right. Well, you know, when I was a kid growing up in the boonies in North Dakota there, on Sunday after church, uh, the old people, like my parents and yeah. their parents, would gather and have coffee and talk. And I kind of eavesdropped on them a little bit. And the theme of a lot of these conversations seemed to be, well, isn't it amazing what they can do these days, someone mm, would say. Sure. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know, I was too young. I, right. Well, now I'm old enough in the weather satellite business. <laughs> you can that remember when. The new yeah. generation of weather satellites, I'm starting to say, isn't it amazing what they can do these days? Because it's always improving. Yes. Maybe uh, an analogy here is like television. Mm -hmm. Television started in black and white, then it went to color. Uh, analog signal transitioned to digital here number of years ago. Standard definition becomes high definition. Right. Well, weather satellites are changing too. The first weather satellites went up around 1960, mm -hmm. not that long ago. No. It's comparatively young science. And, and every time a new series of satellites is launched, see, we learn from the past, so the mad right. scientists uh, decide, well, we could make the next satellite even better in such and such a respect. Yes. And now the United States is on the verge of launching or in progress of launching a series mm -hmm. of new geostationary satellites that are better than ever before. Okay. Let's take a look at some yeah. of the previews of what these new satellites can do. Peek inside the lab here, okay. Yeah, and so we'll peek in, and, and here are some mad scientists yeah, uh, and mad technicians dressed in bunny suits. <laughs> this is, a, believe it or not, this is the business end of a weather satellite under construction okay. in a clean room. Uh -huh. You don't want a speck of dust on the lens of a, right. a weather satellite's camera. So this is done in a clean environment. They are building a geostationary satellite there. Oh, cool. This new generation of satellites, if you had to answer the question, why are these better? Why do we care? Okay. You could answer it with three words, faster, better, more. The new generation of satellites are faster than the older ones. The images are sharper, they're better, and there's more spectral channels. We'll talk about that. Any one of these called Steve Austin it sounds faster, better, stronger? Yeah, <laughs> you know what though, these things cost more than $6 million. Yeah, I'm sure. They're, they're pricey, but they, they are an essential tool mm -hmm. for the Weather Service to fulfill its mission of protecting lives and property. Exactly. You gotta have the tool to do the job, and it, it helps all of us when we get the accurate forecast, the warning in time, and right. this is the tool. Faster, on left here, mm -hmm. we see what the old generation of satellites could scan in five minutes on the right, that's what you get in five minutes, the whole planet, okay. or at least one side of it. So Pretty it's faster. That yep. means you can take more images over a given amount of time and make smoother movie loops oh, out good. of that. Because animating uh, movie loops really helps you highlight a feature that maybe you can't see as well in a Absolutely single image. Absolutely does, yep. Let's zoom into a small piece of real estate like okay. Texas. Sure. And we can see here um, a satellite that has a one minute movie loop visible light. You can see thunderstorms boiling oh, wow. there. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, the, the rippling of the, of the top of the thunderstorm. Uh, this is a fun movie loop. We're going to be see, able to see things like this more and more often because okay. of the new satellites being generated. Some things are only evident in animation. Mm -hmm. So that's faster. Well, what's better? We're able to now have sharper imagery than before. Hmm. Um, the Japanese have a satellite that uses the same imager that okay. is on the new gener generation of satellites that America is launching too. Uh -huh. An imager, that's just a word for camera. It's okay. the camera on a weather satellite. Right. We have something called the Advanced Baseline Imager. Sounds important. ABI, it's important enough, it has an acronym. <laughs> Everything's an acronym. Well, an ABI-like instrument is here over the Western Pacific, and we can see this color image. This is what a human eye might see if you were riding on the satellite. Okay. But it's a little bit fuzzy. With new technology, you can pro post-process the image taken by the satellite. 
to highlight and sharpen some of the features. So this image here of the Western Pacific mm -hmm. then becomes Whoa. this image. Thanks to the That's processing techniques, yes, this is the newest technology. So we've got a new satellite okay. that can provide better data than ever before. Mm -hmm. And on the ground, we can process it better than before as well to really sharpen up the imagery and uh, to give us a, a better view of the weather than ever before. So faster and better and more. What do we mean by more? Well, on the, the older generation of satellites, the mm -hmm. imager, the camera, had five slices of the spectral pie, visible imagery, right. infrared imagery, something we can't see from, the, from okay. the human eye. A lot of different slices of the pie. So we're going from five, the new imager has 16 slices. Each slice has its own relevance. Some are best for volcanic ash, okay. for smoke, for dust, for telling the, the difference between smoke and dust, which can look right. similar under some infrared channels, but other sure. ones bring out certain things. All of these 16 bands are important. In fact, some of the mad scientists, yeah. they didn't want 16, they wanted 24. There's uh, always sure. more you can do, right. but that'll be the next generation okay. of satellites. So now we say, isn't it amazing what we can do these days? And you know what? It makes you think, well, what's the future going to be like, too? It's so important to be able to know what's going on now in the weather. Mm -hmm. If you're going to forecast the future, you've got to know where things are now. And satellites are the way to see that, especially in Alaska, where we don't have as many observations down on the ground. The right. satellites fill in the holes. Yeah, really important stuff. And I, I love hearing about what we can see right now, but I love thinking about what is possible in the future. It's amazing stuff. And since you paid for it, it's a good time to learn about it. If you'd like, check out the website at www.goes-r.gov. And as I understand, it's a really easy website to use. Oh, yeah. A lot of good information about what these new satellites mean to Americans. And uh, it's the Weather Service's mission to protect lives and property. Mm -hmm. And this is the tool how to do it. Cool stuff, Eric. Thanks so much for sharing that with us today. And thank you for joining us right here in Alaska Weather Facts. We'll see you next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. I'm meteorologist Amanda Bowen with your look at the marine forecast. Starting with the sea ice edge, not a whole lot of change in the last 24 hours, but we do expect north winds to continue at least for the western portion of the Bering Sea. So expect that sea ice to temporarily shift a little bit further south, particularly from about St. Lawrence Island westward. In Bristol Bay, we expect some southerly winds over the next couple of days, which is going to bring in warm air and continue that melting of sea ice for Bristol Bay. Taking a look at the marine forecast for southeast, this is where we're gonna have our strongest winds and highest seas over the next 24 to 48 hours. We've got a strong low pressure system moving in. So across the Gulf, we're looking at winds 30 to 40 knots and seas 18 to 19 feet. For the inside waterways, the strongest winds are going to be further south along the panhandle. So 30 knots out of the south uh, near Ketchikan and Metlakatla, 20 knots with gusts to about 40 knots for the central inside waters and lighter winds up near Skagway and Haines about 10 knots out of the south. A little bit of relief on Tuesday as that low pressure system moves through and weakens. So we'll have winds over the Gulf 20 to 25 knots, seas down to about 10 to 14 feet. And over the inside waterways, still, still some strong winds over the southern portions of the inside waterways, 25 knots sustained uh, for the southern most portion of the inside waterways, 15 knots further north. For Monday across South Central, we can see some impacts in the far western portion of the graphic from that low pressure system that's going to be impacting the panhandle. So 25 knots of wind out of the northeast with 14 foot seas for the western portion of the South Central area. But elsewhere, 10 to 20 knots generally out of the north and northeast sees 9 to 11 feet for Monday. Looking into Tuesday, winds and seas both coming down a bit, winds 10 to 20 knots, again generally out of a northerly direction, and seas anywhere from 6 to about 9 feet for the Gulf. 
Monday for the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, 10 to 15 knots of wind out of the west and northwest, seas 5 to 8 feet on the south side of the island, and just 2 to 3 feet on the north side of the island with about 2 feet in the Bristol Bay area. For Tuesday, winds maybe coming up just a little bit, 10 to about 20 knots, seas coming down though about 6 feet on the gulf side and 3 to 4 feet on the north side of the peninsula. Monday across the Aleutian chain, winds lightest furthest east, so 15 to 20 knots for the central and eastern Aleutians and 20 to 25 knots for the western Aleutians. Seas six to eight feet on the south side of the Aleutians and about four to six feet on the north side of the Aleutians with up to about eight feet for the western Aleutians on Monday. Looking into Tuesday, winds and seas both coming up, especially for the western Aleutians, where we'll see seas up to 16 to 21 feet and winds increasing to 30 to 35 knots out of the southwest. Further east in the Aleutians, winds 20 to 30 knots out of generally the south and seas 6 to 11 feet for the south side of the Aleutian chain and 4 to 7 feet for the north side. For the west coast on Monday, due northerly winds 15 to 20 knots. This is what's going to be pushing that sea ice edge probably just a little bit further south at least for Monday. For Tuesday, though, we get a bit of a wind shift, more out of the west and a little bit of northwest. So in the end, that sea ice edge may just be moving a little bit in each direction and overall not changing too much over the next few days. For Monday along the Arctic coast, westerly winds, especially along the north slope where we've got 15 to 25 knots, 10 to 15 knots along the northwest coast, generally out of the west and a little bit of north. For Tuesday, Winds coming down just a little bit, especially along the north slope area. So 15 to 20 knots for the north slope. Still about 10 to 15 knots for the northwest coast on Tuesday. For tonight, we've got that low pressure system, that strong low coming into the panhandle. We talked about earlier, that's going to be bringing heavy rain, high winds, as well as high seas. Thanks so much for watching Alaska TV weather. Uh, we hope to see you right back here again tomorrow. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.